Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be with you again for the second webinar dedicated to the underrepresentation of the women in the science organized by the platform Biology. I am Robin Jean, I'm a journalist. I will accompany you during all these webinar series. And the theme of our today's discussion is the role of women in the leading positions. And to introduce it, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Carmen Fazo. She is member of the organizing committee. Carmen, please. Thank you very much, Romain, and welcome to you all to the second webinar in our uh, nine webinar series dedicated to um, diversity in, you know, in, in a larger context uh, with a clear focus on uh, women and gender diversity in the workplace and specifically within the natural sciences. Now, today's webinar, as Romain mentioned, is dedicated to investigating analyzing and um, critically evaluating women's roles in leading positions. And um, this we felt as an organizing committee was a very, very important topic to address given, given the numbers associated to women in leadership positions, <clears throat> which I think we'll have a chance to take a look at in more detail later on. And hopefully we'll have a chance to also discuss we have a problem with women in leadership positions. There aren't enough women in leadership positions. And the question is why and what can be done potentially to, to change that. Um, we have two um, excellent speakers uh, with us today, Professor Anna Wahl from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and Professor Clara Kulich from the University of Geneva here in Switzerland. And uh, they both have ample experience dealing with the issue of diversity um, and gender balance and gender equity in leadership in a leadership context. And um, I don't want to take any further time from Romain and from our guests. So I'm happy to hand over to Romain and I wish you all an enjoyable webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carmen. You have summed up the, the question, what role can and should women play as drivers for change? And uh, those having more women in leading position change really the leadership style of the organization. We have a lot of questions to ask. We are very pleased to have uh, Professor Anna Val and Professor Clara, Clara Kulish. Anna Val first. She's a great specialist in gender equality, professor in gender organization management at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Sweden, is, as we know, is considered as a very egalitarian country. We will listen very, um, with great pleasure what you have to say, Clara, uh, Anna, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roman. Yes, I, I have the floor and as we are uh, supposed to be quite short here and to the point, I will start sharing my screen immediately. So um, what I want to uh, share with you today is through from the question of uh, um, the role of women in leading positions and we must, as leaders for organizational change, I will present a case uh, uh, that we call Ang Agnes, Agnes, that I have uh, me, myself worked with at uh, KTH, my, my university. And as my field of research is organization studies and, and management studies, I want to say a few words about um, the way that I sort of perceive this area of knowledge and this uh, research field, because I've been <laughs> uh, doing research about women in leadership positions for a very long time in different sectors of society. And it's, I mean, to some of you, this is uh, self-evident and to others it's not, but gender is constructed and socially uh, and culturally, in, in my view, that is something that is ongoing and it's very much changing. And it, it's also um, constructed in relation to context. So uh, 
uh, it's very important to know where and when and, and how and why we study uh, gender and women in leadership. The power perspective is central and also uh, today we often use what we call an intersectional perspective where uh, gender is related to other power dimensions and categories such as ethnicity, class, sexuality, etc. So gender is always important, but it's also uh, does not travel alone. It's always connected to other dimensions. And this is something that we always take in. But I would also like to <laughs> uh, this uh, already now say that I think that uh, academic organizations are gendered. They are not gender neutral. Uh, and this is uh, related to structures and culture. So the leaky pipeline metaphor that is often being used is problematic from this point of view. And I will show you why, <laughs> why I say this. So in organizations, we talk about uh, in what way do we, uh, in what way is inequalities expressed in organizations and, and uh, universities are academic organizations. So we often talk about discrimination in, of different kinds. It might uh, be, be related to salaries, promotion, recruitment, routines, development opportunities, etc. So there are a number of ways to study inequalities also in universities. And of course, sexual harassment, harassment is a, a certain field of where we also study and that we all were, were reminded of 2017 with the move, Me Too movement. But I, I also want to say that research has shown that uh, it is not only the things that actually happen, the things that we could see that, you know, uh, someone is doing something, there is an action activity going on. But a lot of the inequalities in, in organizations and, and very much so in academic organizations is rather what is not happening. And the, the way that we have to try to capture non-actions, invisibilities and lack, lack of recognition, for instance. So it's very important to have this a uh, double perspective of seeing what is happening, but also what is not happening. And uh, of course, we talk about exclusion and excluding uh, cultures uh, in, in a lot of organizations, also in the academy. So the case I want to share with you today, Agnes, uh, a few words about the, the approach of the, the program that I was leading together with the colleagues from KTH. The purpose with the program was to increase women's influence and in the ongoing gender mainstreaming efforts. So there's a lot of things going on uh, in the organization and we wanted to, uh, influence, to, to sort of increase women's influence in this ongoing work for change. So it's not an individual career program uh, to empower women individually, but it's an initiative to support women's change leadership. So it's more that women should be able to change the organization and, and to, um, to work for change. Design was that 18 women on senior levels, both among faculty and administration, uh, were chosen through a certain way of, of uh, finding them, but also uh, a basis for this that they had all expressed a strong commitment to contributing to change. So it's also about their own sort of statement. It was a one year program, uh, all, all together 12 days, and it contained, it was gender theories in the content uh, related to organization management and change. Uh, definitely with a power perspective. And we also used a lot of interactive methods and reflexive exercises that I cannot share with you uh, now. But the empirical data that I'm presenting here is based on follow-up interviews with all the participants one year after. And they were structured around group interviews with three to five uh, interviewees in each group. And the question were very much focused on both, you know, the most important events and insights from the program, but also in what way they perceive themselves as changed leaders and in what way they, they look upon themselves in that way. And we ana analyzed the interviews uh, in, in uh, themes 
and uh, I will go through through some of them here, but very much uh, it's about the common understanding of the problem of inequality that they share after uh, this program. Also a sense of community after sharing experience with each other. Uh, also a uh, um, uh, power of action that they actually felt that they could do, uh, they could uh, do more and, and actually change things. Uh, but also uh, it's about frustration and, and ways to handle frustration because they also kind of increase. So we have in the analysis called this collective empowerment in contrast to sort of individual empowerment that is often the case in academic programs for women that they are sort of on, on an individual level being empowered. This was much more based on the common understanding, the sense of community and power of action that I already mentioned. So all the women experienced increased awareness and knowledge uh, uh, about the kind of problems they wanted to uh, work with and improve. Uh, most women had found it easier to drive organizational change and uh, um, handle frustration. And they had also reached out to other women in the program, as well as to women and men in other parts of the organization in order to create alliances. So after the program, it was not sort of a locked in room with all these 18 women, but the very much outgoing and creating new alliances from that basis. Um, and common for those uh, very few women in this group that did not express much power power of action was their lack of contact with the others from the program. So it, it was also shown that it's very important to keep it going and to keep it alive, uh, the kind of uh, network that was created. And to let you know a little about, you know, to hear their voices, what did they say? Uh, the program was empowerment, which becomes evident when we meet in different situations in the organization, especially in meetings with both men and women. Men often come in and have the power and then we come in and give each other a hug. The men in the room are a bit confused. When someone else is in the room is part of the program, you get strength. Uh, when Agnes has my back, I have received the tools to be able to act and differently, make a difference and to, be, and to be difficult. I'm more daring and I have acquired more space of action. The network is valuable. I know that someone has my back, others that understand. The insight that it's a problem with the system and that Agnes has my back it makes it easier to feel belongingness at my university. There is a space for me. So they actually talk about both feeling the strength, even if uh, uh, Agnes women are not present in the room, they, they are still present uh, mentally for, for all these 18 women. And also that they feel a, a greater belongingness to the university after uh, doing this program, that they are, they, they are sort of belonging to KTH. So what about the expressions of frustration? Well, um, this is not the first time it's been shown, but still it, it needs to be repeated. With increased knowledge and awareness, uh, it's also that increases participant sensitivity to how inequalities are expressed and normalized in the organization. So uh, heightened awareness of the lack of, of a, the lack of the problem insight in the organization is frustrating. So an increased awareness leads to increased frustration. And realizing that others hold participants accountable for solving the problem makes work for change overwhelming. Uh, some of the women felt that, the, uh, that even though this was not communicated to the organizations, sometimes others in the organization thought that they were sort of responsible for the problem instead of being responsible for driving change. And this, this is something that we also recognize from other studies. Seeing women's simultaneous trivialization of gender equality work and their complicity in their own subordination is frustrating was also something that became a problem for some of the um, participants. And also seeing men paying lip service to gender equality is frustrating. So here are some other uh, voices uh, that I want to share with you. I just have to uh, 
um, to realize that it's, uh, it is worse than I thought is not exactly positive. It's tiring. I'm more aware now. It's frustrating that no one gets it because the level of knowledge is too low. I describe how women are discriminated against and no one understands. Knowledge gives both power and frustration. How women ridicule uh, gender equality and turn it into a non-issue. They are part of the reproduction of their own subordination. Extremely disturbing to witness. Not easy when people say it's important, but still nothing happens. They refused to do anything. But they also found ways to handle uh, frustration through the, through the program. So knowledge gave better understanding of how gender equality work can be made more accessible. So they find a lot more uh, practice and skills in doing this. Awareness of how inequalities are reproduced increase motivations to drive change. They are actually understand the problem better, which gives them energy. And there was also a sense of no return. Unawareness is not an option. It's tiring insight that the organizational culture is not egalitarian, but it's also a lever for doing something. So they also get kind of a motivation out of that. It's tough to witness non-events, but I do not want to return to unawareness. So reflect some reflections on method to empower women's leadership. I think it's important to take away that with a focus on organizational change, it's much better re results than on individual career support. This is a big difference. Also, also the selection of participants, that they are committed. Uh, uh, even though they didn't know much, they were committed, they wanted to find out and wanted to be part of driving change. Also explore, explore participants' potential to act as change agents in their everyday work. We did not initiate you know, new projects or new uh, things to do. They were exploring, what can I do in my present position? And they found a lot of things to do how they could use their position and be, become change leaders. But it was not adding on extra things, but doing things differently. Linking program to ongoing work for change in the organization. It was not sort of uh, disconnected from the ongoing work for change, but it was on the contrary, very much connected to it. And interactive and reflexive methods in order to increase collective learning and create sense of community uh, is very, very important because that is the thing that actually helps when handling frustration, but also to get this sort of power of action. And power perspective in content is very important. It's a critical perspective on the metaphor of women as passively leaking out instead of men actually being actively empowered by the gendered academic culture. These are very active processes uh, and the, the leaky pipeline doesn't really get, get uh, captured the, the process, the dynamic of the gendered academic culture. So here are some references and, and I can uh, submit the, my PowerPoints later. So this was only published in a Swedish um, uh, journal, but this summer it was uh, published in Swedish, but we, will, we are sort of translating it right now into English as well. I don't know uh, how I did uh, time-wise, but I was trying to be uh, quick doing this presentation. You're perfect in time. Thank you very much, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I didn't say that uh, our audience can ask questions. We, you have on your screen a Q&A or application button, so you can ask your question and we will answer. We'll ask to Anna Wall and Clara Kulish. I have perhaps first uh, a question for you, Anna. Um, I said that uh, your country is very egalitarian, it sounds like that. Uh, how is the situation in Sweden in, in natural science, in the academic world? Can we say that there is a change, the situation changing or how is it? 
Yeah, we actually have a government requirement of doing gender mainstreaming in all Swedish universities right now. So there's a lot of work going on, but at the same time, we have the same kind of problems that like other European countries have. So, I mean, in terms of numbers and also the, the difference between uh, natural science, technology and humanity, social science and that kind of things. But I still think that the, the whole um, awareness thing is very good, that there is very openly being discussed and worked with. And at my own university, KTH, uh, there's definitely a lot of work going on and very open discussions and, and a lot of people are involved. Of course, both men and women are involved. A lot of men are involved in this work for change. So, uh, and, and this group of women, 18 women have been really important also to, to be sort of pushing uh, for change and being in the whole organizations. But it's not, it doesn't, uh, it's not only that, it's a lot of other things. It's sort of a part of a bigger picture. So we have a, a question. Uh, in one of your first slides, you write, Mrs. Wall, that gender is socially and culturally constructed. Do you mean that gender has no genetic basis whatsoever? Uh, yes, but also biology is interpreted in a social context and in a culture. So we need our, we, we use our own uh, beliefs and perceptions to sort of interpret and not least value what we see uh, that is sort of uh, bio, uh, genetic or biology. So we are never sort of outside that. It's, it's always part of our understanding. Okay, and we have another question. Men were not involved in the program to increase uh, their awareness to inequalities. Was it a choice? Yes, it was a choice because we work so much with men anyway, because we work a lot with the structures that are in place. So we work a lot with the executives, the leaders, uh, the professors, and they are in a majority of men. So the program was to sort of in increase a women's influence and make really women important in this work for change. But it's not, it doesn't mean that we doesn't, don't, do not work with men. I do that quite a lot in a lot of training and also uh, around awareness. And, and I, I think that I also worked previously in programs for change where we sort of have separate groups, also all men groups discussing uh, uh, the kind of what they, how they perceive inequalities, etc. So I think it's, it's, it's more about methods. It's not an ideology to separate, but it's methods. Depending on what kind of groups you formulate, you can, sort of drive the process in different ways. We have another question. Thank you for the talk. Can you give some example for the interactive and reflective method you use in your program? We are running a leadership program for senior female professors. And I'm wondering if we could add, add some of uh, your experiences in our program. I mean, we used some of the methods that are around that are, I mean, this kind of uh, reflections around life stories and, you know, that how did you end up here and, and building stories and also uh, through um, women's own experience of discrimination, we added theory and then they could themselves reflect on in, in groups and to interpret what they had experienced and with the help of theory. So it was a lot of things that we um, sort of, the interaction was that we worked with the group all the time and they were very active. And they were also active in the way that the, the, the program uh, was sort of uh, moving ahead. So we were very sensitive to where they were in their own process. But also that we sort of uh, um, did a lot of, uh, dissemination of knowledge and the lectures and all that, but always with the possibilities of reflecting and discussing and comparing, etc. So that the, it's not a monologue of, of lectures, but very much sort of 
in, in the uh, connecting it to KTH to their own experience. So that, and, and there are a lot of good methods around that you can use doing that, but it's basically the idea how we worked. In, in one of your first slides, you, you spoke about the lack of recognition for women. I have an example. Last, I would like to quote an, art, an article published last week in, our, uh, in one of our online sites, uh, Heidi News in Geneva. And it's um, about a study by the journal PNAS, uh, who tells that only 29% of women have their work published online. And with consequence that uh, women's academic career are slower, they are less invited to speak at conference. It, it was a study um, uh, leading, leading by uh, the University of Northwestern in USA. And um, the conclusion is uh, that there, this is a considerable loss of substance for the science. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the interesting part here, here is, of course, why do they not uh, publish online and what reasons are behind? Uh, and, and also, of course, other studies that they would show that even if you publish, uh, there might be a difference when it comes to recognition of what you publish and in what way, in what way it's being valued, etc. So I, I, I know, I mean, we know this and it, it's, uh, it's very often unaware processes and, and uh, we know now all about not only unconscious bias in, in peer reviewing and etc, but also the kind of um, processes around power games in organizations and, and who is in and who is out and the networks and, and things like that, homosocial cultures. So I, I, I can just say that we have to constantly keep an eye on what's going on and have this critical eye in our discussions uh, at, at each university and that we find out that how does it work here? You know, if we find out something about the uh, university in the US, we have to look at our own university to see, is this also relevant here? Uh, and how could we find out? So it's mm -hmm. a, it could be a good inspiration to do that, but you never know. And now you were a kind of, you are a, a kind of pioneer um, in the field of gender research. Huh? In 1992, you created the group Phosphor to lead um, gender theory in the area of organization management. Can you perhaps share with us some very positive uh, experience you, you made in all these years? I mean, <laughs> um, there is a lot of progress in this area, I would say. I mean, when I did my PhD, uh, there were not that many uh, uh, theses going on in, in organization and, and gender. And, I, and so that has changed. So we always have to see that the next step is to broaden the, and that there are more empirical studies, et cetera. But still it's, it's not quite accepted uh, in all academic settings that we do gender research. And we also see in some of our European countries that the, the sort of resistance against this kind of uh, science uh, has increased. So we always have to sort of uh, remember to, to uh, keep going. It's not, it's not time to relax <laughs> yet. <laughs> but there is a lot more to be, I mean, there's a lot more to take in and there's a lot more published and there is a lot more uh, knowledge to take, to, to use in, in, for instance, in teaching, super uh, important, I would say, teaching to students, but also to uh, PhD students that they actually learn from this field of, of research. Thank you very much. You say we have, I want to give now the floor to Clara Kulish. Uh, Clara, Professor Clara Kulish is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Science at the University of Geneva. Uh, good afternoon, Clara. 
and your uh, studies notably the impact of sexist behavior on women's leadership leadership's aspiration. But I give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Herman. I'm very happy to be here today. So I will also share my screen and then put my PowerPoint on. Um, Okay, I think I'm sharing. Okay, so um, I want to talk to you about um, different types of circumstances in which women may uh, gain leadership and uh, particularly about uh, one association that we have been observing uh, in the last uh, decade or so, that is a Think Crisis, Think Female Association. So I will talk you a little bit through what that means why this is happening and then towards the end of my talk i will put it into a, a more academic context because most of the research has been done in the context of organizations and in the context of um, uh, of politics now some of you might be familiar with this think manager think male association so that's the idea that uh, stereotypes uh, typically associate men more likely with um, traits that are also associated with managers and that there is less of an overlap of uh, stereotypical traits that are associated with women uh, and with uh, leaders. And this is taken as one of the reasons that we see so few uh, women emerge uh, in leadership. However, I mean, when we observe uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, we do see more and more women actually becoming leaders. And so um, more recently, research has been interested in what kind of circumstances women actually make it, break through the glass ceiling and become leaders. And some researchers in the UK have thus uncovered a phenomenon which is called the glass cliff that actually shows that women are more likely to be appointed to leadership positions in times of crisis and instability. So that means women seem to face a higher likelihood uh, to become managers in different contexts, politics and organizations, in sports, but also in academia, following bad performance, uh, following scandals or any other type of adverse uh, circumstances. And this puts them into a quite a difficult situation because if we become leaders in times of crisis, that means we are surrounded by lots of difficulties and trouble, and uh, it can um, increase the risk of fail in terms of, um, of, of one's career. But also it is um, connected with um, a certain level of stress and with situations that can bring uh, really harm to uh, the health uh, of these women. Now, it's not only women who are concerned by this, but uh, several minority groups, so minority groups more in general, but I will more focus on, on the gender dimension here. So why do people think crisis, think female? I will talk you through several reasons for it, where there is some research that points in that direction. And I tell you right away, the phenomenon is quite complex and there is not one explanation for it, but there are many different glass cliff types of context and thus also different types of explanations. So one first explanation um, that would could, one could consider is women associated with a crisis simply because it's sexist. We just put them up into difficult circumstances to see them fail and then to have the proof that women are not capable. We do have some evidence that may point in that direction. So, for example, what we find in the political context is that uh, conservative parties and right wing parties are very likely uh, to nominate female candidates, but also ethnic minority candidates in regions where those um, where the um, uh, parties um, lost in the past. So where it's not very likely that those female or minority candidates will actually win the elections. And the fact of being appointed to those uh, hard to win seats leads to the result that they are less likely to actually win the elections. But it's not as simple as that because one could think, okay, conservative, uh, on a, we are anti-minority, but we also find 
a similar um, phenomenon in, in some left wing or, or more liberal uh, political part parties. So the phenomenon seems to be a little bit more complex and for parties that are more pro-minority, there might be other reasons behind this glass cliff uh, appointments. Now, when we are in a crisis context, uh, one of the things we will think about is we need to change something. And one of the ways of changing something is to exchange the current leader against a leader that is substantially different. So women, but also ethnic minority group members, they look different, they are associated with different characteristics. So it might be actually that we choose women in crisis times because we want to signal change to the outside world. We want to show investors or other people who are observing the organization that we are actually aware of the problems and we are doing something. So in my domain, I'm a social psychologist. Uh, we work a lot with experiments. So one of the studies we did in that context is we showed people uh, an organizational context um, uh, in, a, in a crisis and another one where things were going well. And then we asked people um, to choose we asked them to choose between uh, female or male uh, candidates. And we didn't only ask them to choose a candidate, but also to um, explain why they made the choice they made. So what we found was that people in a crisis context were more likely to choose a female candidate compared to a male candidate. And the reasoning for that was linked to the fact that they associated uh, that woman with um, signaling change. So these were things like saying, um, uh, this choice symbolizes a visible change for partners and competitors. However, when we asked about uh, whether this choice was motivated by choosing someone who is uh, very qualified and who has a suitable leadership style, this did not explain people's choice. So it seems to be quite a strate strategic choice just wanting to indicate to the outside world um, we are aware of the situation, but not so much about the actual qualities that are associated with the woman. Now, we didn't completely put aside this idea that maybe we choose women because they have what it takes, namely communion and more feminine traits, to be good crisis managers. So we might be choosing women because we associate them with skills such as conflict solving, communication skills, and other communion types of behaviors. And actually, there is some evidence in the literature when we ask people about the desired leadership um, characteristics in different types of contexts that show that actually it's particularly in prosperous times that we think about agentic, more masculine traits. And in crisis contexts that we think more about communal traits. However, it's not any type of crisis. So it seems that particularly if the mission is to manage people or to take the responsibility that we will think more about feminine traits and find them more desirable. However, in a crisis where we think about performance improvements, here we will rather opt for more agentic or masculine traits. We did another study in that context where we actually um, confronted participants either with a no crisis context or with a financial crisis context or a relational crisis context. Again, asking them if they wanted to have rather a woman or a man in those uh, contexts as, as a new leader. And what we found was actually that the woman was most likely associated to a relational crisis context second to financial crisis and least to a no crisis context. So it does seem that in relational crisis context, female gender stereotypes may be more valued because the woman was the most chosen in that context, but she was also chosen in a financial crisis context. So there is still something about crisis connected to uh, women. We did actually test whether it was about gender stereotypes, like about um, the perceived relevance of communal behaviors and trade in that context, but uh, this didn't explain uh, people's choice. So overall, what can we conclude is that we do think crisis, think female, and we do think this for different types of crisis, for relational, but also for more uh, masculine types of crisis, like financial crisis, where we would think you need more uh, masculine traits. 
But when it comes to gender, uh, gender traits, there's actually a think relational crisis, think feminine uh, association. So we do associate feminine traits with relational crisis uh, scenarios, but we do not associate them with uh, financial crisis scenarios. So gender stereotypes may in part explain a certain preference of women in relational crisis contexts, but other crisis contexts cannot uh, really explain that preference. So there is, for example, the signaling change um, interpretation that I've talked about, but there may also be other factors. And I want to come to the fourth point I want to make, and this concerns actually the role that women are playing uh, in this situation. So we know that uh, women have uh, limited uh, job opportunities, and it may be that if they get offered more crisis positions, well, they end up uh, choosing one of those crisis positions. But there's also research, um, interview research that has shown, uh, looking at um, um, CEOs from the Fortune 500 companies and um, looking particularly at minority CEOs. And this has shown that in order to prove one's competence for minority group members, it's very important to make actually their social categories, so their gender category for women or their ethnic category for ethnic minorities, to make this um, gender identity uh, less visible, but at the same time, they need to become very visible as an individual and with their uh, personal qualities. So one way of doing this is actually taking on high risk positions and actually try to solve the position because then there is no doubt that when it's solved that they really solved it and it's not any other factor. So maybe women are re quite ready to pay a risk task as a career strategy. Now, most of you are in the context of academia, and maybe some of you have uh, seen the series, uh, The Chair on Netflix. So this is a very nice illustration actually of this uh, glass cliff uh, phenomenon. So if you haven't seen it yet, uh, I advise you to, to watch it because this really perfectly explains to you um, the glass cliff situation. But is there also some academic uh, research on this? Um, studies are rare, but there are a few around. So there's one that's been done in Sweden, where actually um, the female percentage um, in senior management in academia has risen quite a bit and is, is much above other uh, countries in, in Europe. And what came out of these interviews with uh, those female senior managers was actually that this rise in um, women in, in, in senior management actually went uh, in parallel with the decline in status and merit and prestige of these positions with a demand of higher uh, time investment and making those uh, um, positions more difficult to uh, combine with a successful uh, research career. And there's also, um, at this time, it's a, it's a dissertation, but I found, found it quite interesting, where they actually showed that um, the appointment of Black presidents was more likely in uh, US higher education institutions that experienced this, uh, more instances of adverse conditions. So that could be financial hardship, it could be following scandals or a decrease in student numbers, et cetera. So there are some instances of potential glass cliff positions in academia. Now, I would like to show you as an end note, this um, article that was uh, retracted in the meantime, where um, the authors um, said to show that, um, well, they say basically it's a bad idea to have female mentorship because they show that uh, female mentors uh, have students with lower academic uh, outcomes. And um, this was an interpretation that the authors gave on their author, and there was quite some discussion about it. And it was also discussed on Twitter. And there was one very interesting comment uh, by, by this lady who said, one process to explain the association so that female mentors are associated to lower academic outcomes in their mentees is that female faculty are more willing to support and mentor students who are struggling or high risk. So I think this is a very interesting question 
to think about actually um, what the quality of the work is that women and men in such uh, senior positions are, are taking on and willing to do. So maybe women are ready to take the responsibility and to take out on the students that are struggling and uh, to support them through their difficult path. So again, it's not that women drive them into uh, worse outcomes, but it's rather uh, the opposite, that women are ready to take on those high-risk uh, super supervision uh, relations. So what can we learn from this? What should women minorities watch out for? I put you a whole list, so maybe think about when you take on a job, are you the first woman or the first ethnic minority? This could be something to watch out for could be a risk factor. If others refused the job uh, before you took it, are uh, the budget cuts around conflicts, any kinds of crisis or scandals? Is there maybe an additional workload um, added to the position that you're being that you're taking on? Is there supervision of high-risk students involved? We could continue this list. And then also on the other hand, uh, what can people do to help and support women who are in glass cliff positions or to prevent them? So, for example, it would be very important to share informal information that, um, that relates to potential risk that could be associated to a role and that is not so obvious, provide support to women who are already in those uh, glass cliff positions, and it's very important to make aware of those glass cliff causalities, so that often it's not women that actually are the cause of those crises, but rather that the crisis are the cause of the appointment of women or minority groups. So I want to thank you very much. And I've put you up some ways to contact me in case um, you want to learn more about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara. So no crisis, no woman. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you think generally that women are really difference leaders or have you make some study about that or or perhaps better in crisis context and um so we mainly look about the perceiver perspective so when are women being appointed we use archival data so from real organizations and from real political elections and we use also experimental research there is a little bit of research around about uh, women's perspective, but this has not been so well decomposed yet in terms of uh, are they seeking out those situations or not. I think it's it's quite complex, but there yeah there's some research starting on on that line. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree that one of your recent studies in Geneva showed that uh, the appointment of a woman in, uh, to a precarious managerial position is mostly done by non-sexist people. Uh, yes. That means that uh, the cultural bias is, is very deep, huh? even among people who, who, who claim to be non-sexist. I think what is important to look at what are the motivations when um, women are being put into those precarious positions. So I quite like to, um, to point to some results that we had for the American uh, elections, where we actually found that also the, the, the Democrats are putting their women on glass cliffs. But what is important, women actually are more likely to win under those precarious uh, circumstances compared to men. So it's actually for the Democratic Party uh, a good strategy to do this because it makes them more likely to win. And also probably this is happening not in the Republican Party because in the Republican Party, they put people, uh, women and ethnic minorities up into those difficult positions. And in addition to that, they make those positions even more pre precarious by giving them less money to uh, fund the, the election races and not giving them the, the social support. So if we put people up into difficult uh, positions, what is very important is actually the organizational context. Is, is the support, is the person being backed up? And the whole uh, situation can actually become a trampoline for those individuals if there is support around. 
But if they are put into those situations at the same time, they're being treated in a scapegoating way, but trying to actively undermining them, not giving them support, then it's really, really um, uh, a very, very, like very negative consequences are, are likely. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a lot of questions, but perhaps just a reaction of, of Anna, Anna Wall. Anna, are you with us? You can switch on your, yeah. Yes. Uh, perhaps you want to react to the presentation of Clara, just to have yeah. your, your opinion. I'd like to. Thank you, Clara. I think it is uh, very, uh, very interesting and it gets me thinking about a lot of things. Uh, and I totally agree that it's very much about the organizational support and context and the way that the organization perceive it as in a crisis situation or not. And, and in one way, uh, women in male dominated fields are always in a kind of a crisis situation if they take on uh, a leadership position that there has hardly been any other women around or women as colleagues, etc. So maybe it's kind of a, a part of a strategy that women leaders have that this, that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm anyway an outsider, so why not take on this? I mean, it's not worse than anything else because there's never this kind of gender neutral situation for women. Women always have to cope with that and find strategies to handle that situation. So maybe it might just as well be an open crisis. So uh, one thing that I was thinking about uh, and I would like to ask you is, what about the, the climate crisis? Do you see, uh, have you heard anything about that women are more often appointed? I mean, that is kind of a very uh, huge crisis we all encounter now. Is that something that has been shown in this kind of studies or something that you could say something about? I do not have something exactly about the climate crisis. We are doing some research in the context of the COVID crisis. And we've seen, for example, in France, there was an emergence of uh, female leaders now uh, following the last election. So for the first time ever in the 10 largest cities in France, half of the mayors are women. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we've also seen, so for example, in my own uh, city in France, I live in France, there was always a right-wing government. And now of a sudden we have a green um, mm -hmm. mayor and who in addition is an ethnic minority member. So I think there are a lot of incidences that may make you believe that something in that direction is taking place. But change is not only about gender. So change is about, diff it ca can also be about different social categories, I think. And, and the, yeah, the climate, I mean, the climate is also often something that is associated with a more cooperative, more global thinking, more sustainable, more feminine way of leading. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if tendencies in that direction would. Um, would yeah, come. Because we also know that women are more uh, worried about the climate change. Uh, yeah. and they're also, they are more victims of the climate change. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's kind of a very gendered issue. Yeah. So yeah. To turn back, excuse me, to turn back to the academia, we have a, a very interesting question. In ac academia, it seems that men are indirectly favored because the selection is targeted at a certain personality types. It so happens that the favored personality is typical of alpha males, large ego, dominant style, boosting confidence. Uh, while these personalities, as this question, are tolerated in men, uh, they are much more criticized in women. Why? Oh, <laughs> it's kind of a very basic, uh, uh, I mean, it's kind of the core of the, a lot of, of the problem and discrimination and, and yeah. the whole gender order, I think. Uh, we call this the hegemonic masculinity. That is kind of the ma masculinity that also men are supposed to uh, be sort of positioned in this hierarchy. And, and of course, women. So it's, it's very connected to... Uh, the kind of um, power games and uh, it's very much about power I would say uh, and to challenge that kind of model of, of leadership is, is very much to challenge power. Clara? 
Yeah, I think it's it's uh, for women when they become leaders, there is kind of an identity conflict because there is this prototype of a leader, like think manager, think male, and then a woman is supposed to be leader, and at the same time she's supposed to be a woman, and so people have difficulties in in yeah seeing those two identities combined in the same person, and it speaks against the social norms we, we grew up with and in our society it is actually acceptable to um to 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 show negative behavior and discrimination against individuals who actually violate those uh, social norms and so that yeah that often happens that women who show themselves in agentic ways that this is perceived uh, very differently. It's maybe interesting uh, in that context, uh, there has been quite some research um, in the recent year about, uh, years about a phenomenon that is called the <laughs> B behavior. So um, there was this um, outcry that when women become managers, that they are not very supportive towards other women and why should we then uh, <laughs> elect women if they are not being very supportive. And we've done some research um, and also many other people in that area that actually shows that it's all about the context. So if these women in the leadership positions are in a context that is poor diversity, then they are very supportive of, of other women and, um, and they, 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 they really push other women to, to, to also make it in the environment. However, in contexts that are anti-diversity, diversity is not valued. In fact, these women need to survive. And one way of surviving is doing what all the others do. And the, all the others are white, heterosexual men. So mm -hmm. it, it's not about the women, it's really about the context Perfect. that will mm -hmm. uh, in, impact on, on how we behave. Mm -hmm. It's what we call in organization studies in homosocial cultures, women's behavior becomes heterosocial. That means that men acknowledge other men and women do the same. And it's all about surviving. So it's very, I totally agree. It's very much about the, the context. context and the, the kind of ideas that is uh, around there and the space for women to, to take. We have, we have a last question for, for both of you. Uh, interesting to, 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 because we try in this website, sorry, to be very concrete, to have recommendations. And this question, could you, could you briefly comment on possible solutions, how to reduce the glass cliff phenomena? Perhaps uh, to you, Anna, and after to you, Clara, one or, or, or two recommendations, solutions to be to be very concrete. Mm -hmm. well, I, 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 I can turn back to the Agnes case. I think that yeah. that is one solution to understand that uh, if women share the same kind of, they make the problem analysis together and they make strate strategies together, they can actually cooperate and, and do change much easier than when it ends up on an individual women leader. It's very, very difficult. So I say that is the, the collective empowerment is the solution. The collective empowerment. Yeah, I, very I, good. I, Perhaps for the University of Geneva, Clara. I really <laughs> your, <love> your, <laughs> your recommendation. Yeah, I, I, it's really this collective empowerment um, uh, notion is I'm really 100% on this as well. And it's a problem in many, many leadership programs that we get today. I mean, I, I just became a professor and I'm getting in all these leadership trainings. And it's often something, yeah, it's for women to make them like the men. And that's not the move forward. It's the, the move forward is not creating individual excellent women, but we have to, to work from the basis. We have to support all the women because the women who are already excellent, they will make it at some point. But the importance is that all the women get the support as, as it's the case uh, for, for the men. So... I, I'm really completely on this collective empowerment rather than individual <laughs> empowerment uh, side of the coin. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. We are coming uh, to the end of this hour. It was very, very interesting. Thank you very much. We have heard about the, the experience of Sweden and, and Geneva, this very interesting uh, uh, studies in, G in Geneva. Thank you very much, Anna, uh, Anna Wall. Thank you very much, Clara Kalik. 
Um, thank you for your interest. Uh, as said, it was recorded, so you can see, you can watch this uh, webinar on YouTube uh, with a summary uh, of the discussion on the platform of the Academy of Science bi platform biology. Uh, see you. I give you next for the next uh, next uh, webinar is on October four. Our next webinar is dedicated to the neurobiological uh, differences between men and women. It's very interesting too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.